Okay, again, thanks everybody for joining. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, at the very beginning, it's going to be a little bit distracting as uh, people join. Uh, and unfortunately, with uh, this version of WebEx, we don't have the ability to turn off the beeps. Um, so we're just kind of stuck there, and we apologize, and uh, we'll hopefully get our way through that. Um, today's webinar, we're going to talk about uh, mobile risk on iOS and Android. Um, we obviously see quite a bit of that in the news, especially on the Android side. Um, and we wanted to uh, take some time to give you our perspective. Um, we'll walk through, broadly speaking, uh, what the risks are. Um, we'll have techniques that you can use to try to address those risks. And we'll also do a, a little bit of a technical step-by-step -step, uh, on several of the um, most recent things so that you have a sense for how are these things achieved and what might you do to prevent them. Uh, just briefly, my background, I'm a co-founder and CEO of Via Forensics. I've published a number of books on this topic. Um, computer science is how I got started in all of this, um, and when I got into the forensic and security business about four years ago or five years ago, I've been hooked ever since. Um, so um, uh, I stay, I remain very technical, uh, and I'm happy to, to be able to jump on the call today. Um, but I also speak to a lot of senior audiences, and so uh, any questions that you guys have, please put them in the chat window, uh, and feel free to answer or ask both uh, technical as well as uh, maybe very higher level policy questions. Um, one of the things that we shared, probably in our last presentation, but I just want to make sure folks uh, on this webinar have a chance to see it, is, is that uh, everybody kind of knows that, that mobile is, is the new uh, way that people are connecting to services. It's the new uh, way that uh, customers are demanding uh, updates. Um, but uh, it's very helpful to see what the actual numbers are. So IDC uh, put out uh, this update uh, earlier this year. Um, with what the 2012 purchases were for mobile devices. And they also included desktop PCs, just as a matter of comparison. So in 2012, we bought about 1.2 billion devices, uh, and uh, desktops were essentially uh, pretty much the lowest one, just right behind tablets. Um, portable PCs or laptops uh, are still kind of considered mobile by a lot of different agencies. Um, but on the far right, you can see the smartphones were clearly taking off with just over uh, 700 million in 2012. If you look out to 2017, though, we're looking at about 2.25 billion devices. Um, desktops uh, actually, I think, decrease ever so slightly. Um, they'll remain important, and uh, IT departments will be refreshing uh, desktops, but they'll be buying uh, a little bit less. Um, tablets will probably more than double, um, uh, triple, in fact. Uh, laptops will also have a, a pretty good growth, uh, but clearly the winner here at uh, over uh, uh, 1.3 billion will be uh, smartphones. And so um, this reality is here to stay. It's something that uh, we're all benefiting from personally, and we all have to deal with from a, from a corporate perspective as well. Um, and you know, what, what is it about mobile? Why is it a game changer? Well, first of all, you know, these devices kind of marched in the front door uh, for all of us, unbeknownst to many of us, uh, in 2007 and 2008. Um, Exchange had services online that allowed the iPhone to hook up. Uh, people became quickly enamored with the ability to get their email on the iPhone device, and from there, uh, there's been an enormous explosion. So um, the BYOD is essentially here to stay. It's outside of IT's control because these are not uh, corporate-owned devices. Um, and they do operate on, on both sides of the firewall. They go home with people every night. They go on trips uh, around the world, uh, and then they come back, and they're sitting inside your, your network. Um, and it, it's a combination of both personal information and uh, sensitive corporate data. So it's the perfect target uh, if you're looking at cyber criminals saying where can they get maximum value, and it's that device uh, that's going to contain all of that information. Uh, and lucky for them, there's lots and lots of code on these devices. It's not all that well tested, uh, perhaps not tested at all. So uh, we'll touch on vulnerabilities in a little bit, uh, but there's a lot of opportunity to gain access to these devices. Um, and something that uh, took a little while for me to, to realize, but I want to make sure I point it out to you, um, is that um, the mobile devices are unique in the sense that uh, there is no uh, easy way for security vendors or, or IT um, uh, departments to gain uh, low-level access to these devices. Um, certainly, they could be jailbroken or rooted, uh, but one of the big challenges that we face is on your laptops and desktops, um, you can always get administrative privileges, and uh, the security industry has written software that allows you to do DLP, uh, monitor what devices are being connected, uh, you know, talk about firewalls and things of that sort. 
but on the um, on the mobile side, we're really essentially locked out of these devices. Um, in part, I think because they originally developed as consumer devices, uh, and so the Googles and the Apples, the Verizons, T-Mobiles of the world are saying, "Hey, trust us, uh, this stuff's secure," and we don't really have uh, many things that we can do as an alternative. Uh, and so that's going to be, uh, I think, a really big challenge for us, and something that bringing some awareness to that issue um, could really help the industry out in the long term. Um, the the devices themselves are obviously pervasive, and when we think about mobile attack. Uh, or the risks and the threats that are out there, we really think of it as twofold. Um, this was the topic of our of our last webinar. It's been posted on our website, um, so you can uh, go out there and, and, and take a look at it if you'd like to. That was corporate espionage uh, via uh, mobile compromise. Um, so on, this, on the one hand, you have the compromising of an individual device. Um, and you could come in and you would look at a vulnerability on the device operating system. You would find an app that, that, that you can gain access to. Um, has lots of good information about you, about your company. The attacker is going to want to get their hands on that information. Um, and, you know, it's very difficult to kind of enforce security standards on those devices because you don't own them and it's, it's hard to get them updated and, and things of that sort. MBM is trying to solve some of those problems, but it's certainly a challenge we all face. Um, but we also encourage people to think about the threat from mobile devices more broadly and that the device itself could be really the launch pad for further compromise within your organization. So if you think about these devices and if it's been compromised, um, when they walk into your office building, um, they will scan the wireless networks. They will you know, detect other Bluetooth devices. If they um, connect the phone to their computer to charge it, even if you're blocking endpoint security, um, that can provide the attacker access, whether it's through a simple attack like an auto-run INF to try to get malware installed on your computer, which most people will block, or something as sophisticated as what we did uh, in our last webinar, which is uh, turning the, the phone into a wireless USB keyboard that we will control out over the cellular network. Um, so uh, they can do a lot of reconnaissance. Uh, they could potentially install malware or other Trojans they can put on the phone. Um, and it's a target that's constantly moving. So you're not really sure what's the state of this device. Is it, is it friendly or is it doing something malicious? Um, you can't really get auditing software on there. And so you're really just kind of uh, at the mercy of whether or not one of the devices is collecting that, that information. Uh, and we think this is something that, that folks ought to consider. It's not the, uh, the focus of this presentation, uh, but again, we have more information from two weeks ago out there on this topic. Uh, the other thing that we'd like to differentiate between is, is uh, security and privacy. Um, you know, what's the difference? Um, uh, in data security, you know, kind of simply put, is, is we're trying to make sure we can protect the information, protect the device from unauthorized access. So only the people uh, who should have access can gain access to the data. Um, and a good example of that is SSL, TLS, you know, in the encryption uh, that, that's done on, on hopefully most apps uh, out there um, will protect the data in, trans uh, uh, in transmission. Um, but how that data gets used uh, when it's received on the other end is much more of a privacy question. Um, so you could securely uh, send information, make sure that third parties can't snoop on that information. Uh, but on the other end, is that information stored? Is it stored securely? Is it shared with other business partners? Do they sell, sell your information? And that's a really good example of, of the difference between data security versus data privacy. Uh, on the security side, you're typically focused on operational and technical uh, controls. And then on the, on the privacy side, of course, it's more about policy and procedures. And so we summarize data privacy as more of a governance and use issue uh, versus the actual protection of the data at rest or in transmission. Uh, and we really think that companies uh, have to consider both of these in their, in their overall strategy. Um, certainly data security is very important and you can't have data privacy without it. Um, but just because you have good encryption and good transmission uh, protection of data in transit um, doesn't necessarily mean that the information uh, is used and governed properly uh, at the endpoint. So both of these topics uh, really need to be taken hand in hand. Um, and as we shared in, in the um, in, in the previous webinar, you know, how does somebody take a malicious device and, and kind of compromise the security that that you built up uh, within your corporation? Uh, and as I mentioned, it can be as simple as as connecting a device to be charged. Uh, and, and in the uh, RSA talk we did last year. Um, here's where we essentially created a uh, wireless keyboard. They hook it up for charging. Uh, we come in over the cell network, and then we essentially have remote hands-on keyboard. Um, and we can either type 
directly on keyboard, if you will, and, and, and interact with the keyboard, or we could even um, upload a, a, a malicious payload and have it push it uh, to the local computer. And that has effectively uh, gotten around uh, full, di uh, full disk encryption. It's gotten around uh, two-factor authentication uh, that you may have on the machine. And it's gotten around endpoint security uh, because all end support end uh, point security uh, pretty much allows keyboards unfettered access. So uh, this presentation focuses on iOS and Android. Um, I think everybody knows this. Uh, so we just thought we'd throw out some, some up-to-date numbers. This is, I think, from uh, Comscore uh, recently. Um, and so current market share numbers are about 39% for, um, uh, for Apple uh, and 52% for Android. So that's somewhere around 91% of the market is covered just by these two operating systems. Um, and there's just breadcrumbs from the left for everybody else. I think uh, BlackBerry still uh, headed into negative numbers, uh, are still going down in market share. Microsoft struggling to just get a little bit more, uh, and you know Symbian is, is essentially dead, but um, they're going to be pushing on the Windows Mobile, uh, the Windows Phone side as well. Um, so this is obviously the emphasis of, of this talk is to look at the 91% of the market uh, just in those two uh, carriers, um, and you know there's a lot of similarities, but there's also a lot of differences uh, between these two uh, uh, platforms. And I think the most obvious one, especially from a security researcher's standpoint, is, is how open are the, are the platforms? Um, and Apple takes a very uh, controlled approach to this. They want to control the user experience, um, you know, the, the source code. None of the source code is open sourced. Uh, they provide the OS plus the hardware. And you can contrast that with uh, Android just had their 4.3 release today or, or yesterday. New codes out on the Android open source project. Uh, new images to be downloaded. And so, um, there's uh, a lot more openness. Uh, it's not 100% open source, but a lot more openness. And that's certainly something that security researchers benefit from greatly uh, because we can spend a lot more time focusing on the key security features instead of uh, breaking uh, uh, reverse engineering and things of that sort. Um, the App Store is tightly controlled on iOS. You have to have a paid account. They're going to sign the apps. It's going to be reviewed. Um, Android has uh, a review process in place as well. Um, and they've got Bouncer that does some of this stuff automatically, but it's certainly less restrictive and, and less effective. Um, this is really the black eye for, for Android. Um, much of the malware that you end up reading about is not found in Google Play Store, but it's found in alternative uh, app stores. Um, so whether those are app stores running out of foreign countries and people have to essentially sideload the apps, or whether they're even things like uh, Amazon or, uh, or other app store providers, um, it's a much more federated, loosely controlled um, uh, environment, and I think that's one of the big challenges Android's facing. Um, the updates uh, for Apple are uh, controlled by them. It's pushed by them, and it's rather amazing to watch how quickly the ecosystem for Apple gets updated. I think overnight, over 50, 55 percent, uh, within a few days or a few weeks, the majority of the phones will be updated to the latest version of iOS. Uh, and, and again, here's one of the ma major challenges faced by Android. In fact, it's, uh, there's been a complaint against them, I think, to the FTC uh, now, where the manufacturers uh, are simply not pushing Android security updates. And so you'll buy a phone, you won't get any updates, there'll be a known exploit, and there's absolutely nothing you can do. Uh, whereas Apple will push those updates independent of the carriers, uh, and so those will go out very, very quickly. Um, so these are two very, very different approaches. Uh, Android's been incredibly successful in terms of overall market share. It's a, it's a great operating system. You know, it's essentially, uh, for, for in large part, free to the, uh, to the OEMs and the, the manufacturers, the carriers, uh, and they can then expand upon that. Uh, and so they have an enormous market share, but there are challenges uh, that both platforms face. When we talk about uh, mobile risk, we really uh, put it into three separate categories. The first one, and I think the one that gets uh, most people's attention, at least from a press standpoint, are security uh, risks. These are ones where your device or your app has been exploited uh, and your information can be pulled off of the device. Uh, but there's a second category to point out. Uh, a lot of uh, companies that we work with are uh, operating in businesses that have compliance and regulatory uh, requirements placed on them. Um, and uh, information about the business, information that falls under those regulations are clearly um, flowing through mobile devices. Uh, and so that's an area that, that needs to be addressed as well. And finally, uh, there's going to be more and more legal and e-discovery uh, challenges that companies face. 
uh, the information may be responsive to some sort of legal um, event. It may be responsive to some sort of internal investigation, whether that's HR related or whether that's a security matter. And so uh, these are the three broad categories that we think folks managing mobile risk at a company need to think about. The threats themselves against the devices, uh, as well as having the device used to gain further access to your network, compliance and regulatory uh, requirements that you have in place, and then legal uh, and e-discovery. And I want to share with you some, some specific examples um, for each one of these. And so uh, you can have a sense for, well, that, that's interesting at a high level. Well, what does it mean in the real world? Um, and I think one of the most well-publicized uh, vulnerabilities um, uh, on, on Android is one called the Exynos uh, exploit that came out um, really prevalent from a, on a lot of Samsung devices. Um, and uh, we'll talk about the master key exploit in a couple minutes, which is why we didn't choose to focus on it here. We'll do a technical deep dive on that one. Uh, but Exynos was a way that um, the, the, the chip itself, uh, uh, access was provided to, to raw memory. Uh, we could read it and write it. Anybody could do that. And it gave you the ability to basically escalate privileges uh, on the device. And tens of millions of devices uh, were impacted and, and remain impacted by this, uh, by this exploit. And so these are consumer devices. They're being used in BYOD scenarios. They could simply be your customers. If, uh, if you're on a banking, uh, if you're a financial institution, your customers may be using these devices. Um, and it's rather trivial to exploit this. There's uh, code that's been bundled up, ready to go. Um, part of the demo that we give is that we write a RSS reader uh, that allows you to read the, the news off of a website. Um, and instead of downloading the news all the time, uh, we can put a... Uh, uh, a binary in there which the app will execute for us uh, and then we'll gain root privileges and from there we can install whatever we want to compromise the device. So there's literally hundreds of examples of this. We just chose Exynos uh, exploit because that's one that affects a large number of, of devices and Samsung is, is patching it and some of the carriers are patching it but quite a few of them still remain vulnerable. Uh, on the regulatory and compliance side, um, this is from a specific example that we have. We have a, a customer that we work with, and we, we essentially do a fairly uh, uh, continuous auditing or fairly consistent auditing uh, on their mobile devices. They were a BlackBerry shop. Um, they found that it did not uh, meet uh, the needs that they had from a business perspective that they could achieve with the iPhone um, and the Android devices and now looking at Windows Mobile. Um, and so they essentially moved away from the BlackBerry platform um, everybody felt that BlackBerry was very secure, um, but I think over time people realized that the encryption could be cracked, um, that there's an Achilles heel in BlackBerry in their enterprise server, and that uh, all that communication uh, travels through the BlackBerry enterprise uh, service. And so there's a single kind of uh, choke point or a place where a government can, can put pressure on uh, BlackBerry to gain access to the keys um, that they need to, to decrypt the data. Um, and so there's a, uh, and then there's issues with data being backed up on on uh, computers and things of that sort. So the BlackBerry platform wasn't bulletproof by any means. Um, and now that there was kind of a crack in the armor, everybody looked at it and said, you know what, mobile's here to make our company more efficient. Uh, and so they're pushing very strongly into um, into the other platforms. And so, um, uh, but this particular company is governed by a lot of regulatory and compliance issues. Um, and they need to come in and do audits and try to understand uh, what, what data exists on the device, how might it be compromised, um, you know, what if you're taking these into sensitive environments and things of that sort. Uh, and it's been a real learning process because you're taking the challenges of devices that sometimes have known vulnerabilities and saying, as an enterprise, how do you mitigate these risks? Uh, but by going through that auditing process on a fairly regular basis, they're able to find out what information can be extracted from the device, um, how do they prevent that in the future, and what sort of strategies can they plan for moving forward to, to deploy these technologies uh, within their enterprise? And that's been something that uh, they've continually come back and, and, and uh, continue these audits on a regular basis because the value that they're getting out of it uh, to managing the mobile risk has been quite significant. Uh, one last story that I want to share with you. Uh, again, uh, we won't be able to name any, any company names, but uh, I was involved in an expert case uh, that revolved around uh, recovering 26 deleted text messages from an iPhone device. And uh, an issue we were brought in in the case was a, um, uh, an internal matter, and they were investigating um, the recovery of these messages in case they were responsive to an incident that had occurred uh, at the company. And in the midst of doing that recovery process, 
um, the, the case then uh, actually became a civil case um, in court, and that kind of launched and kind of took it to a new level. So instead of just doing the internal investigation, uh, there was now a case in federal court uh, on, a, on a civil matter. Um, but after that point in time, actually DOJ got involved and it became a criminal investigation. Uh, and ultimately, the, the company uh, had to settle and spent millions of dollars in that process. Um, so 26 deleted text messages kind of translated to, you know, hundreds of hours of consulting on our time. You know, they probably spent maybe 100000 with us, and they spent millions of dollars with the attorneys uh, litigating the case and, and, and negotiating, uh, not to mention the settlements, which I'm not privy to. Um, and it's really a, a remarkable case to think about because uh, there were so many things that were going on in addition to this, but an enormous amount of energy was focused on 26 messages on a personal iPhone. Uh, that all of a sudden became uh, in the spotlight and responsive to the case overall. And this really highlights the challenge that I think companies are going to face down the road. We certainly need to be concerned about our devices getting exploited. We need to worry about data being pulled off, uh, unauthorized access to that data. Um, but how do we take uh, information that may be residing on a personal device that has to do with the company, uh, maybe even gets all the way into the realm of, of a legal case, um, these are some of the challenges that we think uh, are being faced by, by companies. Um, and if you think about the mobile exploits uh, and how you can protect yourself, well, a lot of people uh, ask, well, can we simply apply the paradigm of, of uh, uh, antivirus detection? Uh, it's kind of worked on the uh, on computer, so shouldn't that work on mobile? And there's lots of companies out there that are offering those services. Um, and what we like to share with people that uh, our belief is that that particular model, particularly a model that tries to say these are known bad um, uh, malicious uh, applications, is a fundamentally broken model on mobile. And the primary reason is that uh, mobile applications run inside a sandbox. And the sandbox is meant to limit uh, that application's access to the system, uh, to other app data, and to protect uh, the information of that application as well. Um, and unfortunately, the, the antivirus devices, uh, antivirus programs, uh, operate under those same constraints, which comes back to a point I made uh, at the very beginning of the talk here, that without uh, privileged access to the, to the system, the security um, uh, vendors, uh, us included, don't have the ability to write the software that we need to help really protect your device. And so what you have is a really crippled version of an of a application that cannot detect uh, the types of sophisticated threats that exist against you. And, and this screenshot is just an example. Um, shortly after a piece of malware came out uh, that was targeting a, a conference in Tibet with Tibetan activists, um, uh, the one, one virus company had detected it. And uh, when you went and looked at VirusTotal to see how many other mobile antivirus will detect that particular uh, malware, uh, it was one out of 46. It was just the original guys. Um, so, you know, they just simply do not have the ability uh, in the system to detect the advanced attacks. Uh, and therefore, you know, antivirus is not the way that you're going to protect uh, against mobile attacks. And we just kind of threw together um, a slide here that shares um, some of the more well-known fails uh, in mobile security. We could pick any one of those. Um, uh, one of the folks here was pointing out uh, the... Uh, uh, until earlier this year, the Apple Ice, uh, the um, App Store for Apple, was not actually uh, initiating its connection over uh, HTTPS. So it was an insecure connection when you first contacted it. And that left an opening for the attacker to get in the middle, uh, inject some JavaScript, ask you for your username and password, grab that, and then uh, have access to the App Store under your credentials. Or to even swap apps around, send you different apps, have you push and install different different apps that you weren't intending to install. Um, and uh, there, there's a whole bunch of different examples out here. If we tried to put all of them out there, you simply would not be able to see it. Um, but uh, in the far right-hand corner uh, next to Captain Picard there, we have uh, any.do. Um, and um, uh, they're an example of an app uh, that has a lot of problems. Um, we've spent uh, weeks and months testing their app, uh, sending the information to the company, uh, and they're simply unresponsive. And so a, a couple months ago, we finally did a full disclosure of, of what the vulnerabilities are and, and suggested that uh, from the millions of people that have downloaded that app, that they essentially not run it uh, due to the seriousness. Uh, we jokingly say that, that uh, uh, we appreciate what they've done in the sense that uh, they 
demonstrate very well our mobile forensic software that we wrote with Via Lab uh, because it shows every single feature uh, uh, working on Via Lab because uh, they basically fail every uh, every test that we do. Um, so these are examples of, of apps, of exploits, of vulnerabilities. Sometimes they're coming from big developers. Sometimes they're coming from small one, you know, one-off shops. Uh, but these are just a select, uh, limited number of challenges of, uh, that I think people are facing uh, in the mobile space. Uh, and who's responsible to solve these? Uh, we did cover this in our last webinar. Um, this is a very complicated dance. Unfortunately, there's a lot of different actors involved, whether it's the OS developers, uh, the device manufacturers themselves. We had the wireless carriers. All three of those could play an enormous role uh, and what software is running on your device and how secure is it. Uh, but on top of that, app developers, whether they're coding it out of their apartment at night in the hopes to strike it big, uh, or they're um, in conjunction with companies and in, in, in writing apps for large uh, corporations. The apps have an enormous amount of, of control uh, that they can exert on the device over your information, uh, certainly the information in their app, but potentially in other apps. Uh, and so they play a big role. Uh, and companies themselves, you know, are you pushing your own MDM software? Are you pushing your own certifications? What sort of policies and tracking and monitoring do you have in place? Uh, and last but not least, the end users themselves. Uh, they make decisions every day, and they may not be the best decisions in terms of security or privacy, uh, but it's up to them, and they make those decisions, and so we have to, to deal with that in the overall uh, management of the risk that they face uh, and thus the company faces. And how do attackers get in? Well, we, we think that mobile provide, provides one of the largest attack services that's out there. Uh, it's touching so many different types of systems. Uh, so many different actors are involved, as we talked about in the previous slide, that there's a lot of opportunity uh, to gain access to these devices. And it could be through uh, apps such as the web browser. That's a very traditional way to get in because a lot of them use the web, uh, WebKit. Uh, and there's a lot of issues out there with WebKit uh, that have been well documented, but, but mobile devices aren't all updated. There's system level uh, issues, um, circumventing passcodes, cracking the encryption, um, uh, simply just uh, poorly coded uh, um, uh, update processes, things of that sort. Uh, lots of problems there. The phone and SMS provide potential vectors, uh, but apps themselves are really one of the largest uh, uh, vectors. Poorly written apps can put your information at risk. And we're going to give you some examples of that. Uh, but, but the uh, mobile device also talks to the network. And so there's a whole bunch of, of network things that can go on, whether it's DNS spoofing, man-in-the-middle attacks, um, SSL strip, uh, all kinds of different things that can go on uh, on the network side. Uh, and then finally, on the data center, um, uh, poorly configured web servers, SQL injection attacks, and things of that sort. Because the apps are always talking to back-end web services. Um, and uh, there we also find quite a few vulnerabilities. Um, how does this kind of look from an uh, external standpoint? Well, uh, MITRE tracks uh, vulnerabilities that are reported to them. Um, this, uh, these charts have made a bit of a, uh, a stir recently because it really surprises people to see this. Um, uh, this comes back to kind of the odd couple between iOS and Android and how they approach the market. But, uh, on the left-hand side, um, uh, since 2007, there's been 238 CVEs for Android, I'm sorry, for iOS. And on the right-hand side, you can see, uh, quite shockingly, only 27 uh, CVEs for Android. And, and as security researchers, that first pass, that really confuses us as well. Uh, but one of the things uh, that we think is important to point out here is, is that uh, the Android operating system gets an enormous amount of scrutiny from the security community. Um, the Source code is, is analyzed from the, the open source project. Apps are reverse engineered. Uh, proof of concepts uh, are done. It's just uh, one of those platforms that allows us to do a lot of different testing. And um, while there's been challenges to Android because it gives them a bit of a black eye, um, from a low-level standpoint, uh, the trajectory of, of security that they have is actually quite high. However, the biggest challenge that they face is that even though they can patch a, uh, a bug very, very quickly, it doesn't make it into the market fast enough or sometimes not at all. And so the recent master key exploit that uh, Blue Box uh, talked about for their um, uh, RSA talk, uh, that was subsequently um, uh, the details came out and has, has been fairly well publicized at this point, that was patched back in March by Google. Uh, but still, today, almost every phone on the market remains vulnerable. Uh, some of them are, are now getting patches, and some of the most recent phones 
uh, did have the fix in it as well. Um, so there's a big difference between vulnerabilities that are reported versus vulnerabilities that are exploited in the wild. And that's where there's a, a stark difference between the numbers that you see here. Um, Android has fewer CVEs, but far greater number of malicious apps and attacks that come against it. Um, iOS has a far greater number of CVEs reported, but much less either happens or gets reported um, in the general public. And so um, one of the main takeaways from this, though, is, is that um, the Apple developers aren't any better at writing a secure operating system than the Android developers. Uh, and in fact, we would contend that uh, putting the two latest kernels up against each other, uh, you might argue that uh, Android is a more secure platform. Um, but when you look at the fragmentation in the market and, and what's playing out in reality, uh, Android certainly has uh, very large problems to, to overcome. Um, but looking beyond just the core platforms themselves, we recently tested right around 100 apps, um, about 30 or plus are on iOS, almost 50 of them on Android. And we wanted to share with you, you know, what our findings were. Um, 15% of the iOS apps and 20% of the Android apps fail man in the middle. And we, we think that this is just unacceptable. And so these are, are apps that don't properly validate certificates. Therefore, uh, an attacker can sit in between your, your secure trans uh, transaction, uh, mimic the uh, receiving bank or whatever, um, and uh, intercept all of your information. Uh, and so this is a very, very serious threat. And this number should be zero. It's very easy to fix. It's very easy to test. Um, and it's still a problem uh, that I think we face. If you consider maybe the average phone has uh, 100 apps installed, you're looking at 15 to 20 apps are going to be vulnerable to this attack. Um, uh, much higher number, although maybe a bit more challenging to, um, to, to execute, is that a lot of them are storing passwords uh, in a very recoverable format. And so um, from here on out, the iPhone apps actually fare worse than the Android apps. Um, and so for iPhone, um, almost a quarter of the apps or a quarter of the apps uh, are storing your passwords in keyless files, in database files. A lot of these files get backed up, whether they're locally backed up from iTunes or whether they're stored out in the iCloud. Um, and so your information is basically being uh, insecurely stored uh, and backed up in all kinds of places that are outside of your control potentially. Uh, so this is a big problem as well. Um, it's a lot harder to exploit memory. It is possible to do that. Um, some apps and some uh, OS flaws have allowed access into, into memory. And so a much, much higher number of apps are uh, storing your password uh, in RAM and not clearing it out, which is one of the best practices we have. Uh, once they're done authenticating you, they can clear that out and, and not keep it in RAM. But a much, much higher number, upwards of 65% on iOS, are storing that insecurely. And then we just have a catch-all bucket. We have a whole bunch of other high-level uh, fails that we do in our security testing. Um, and broadly speaking, uh, most apps are, are, are struggling right now. So almost 75% of iOS apps fail at least one of our high-level um, uh, criteria that we test. So unfortunately, the apps are not faring any better. Um, we did a study in 2011, uh, and really the, the numbers have not improved. Um, you know, we always tell uh, our customers to assume that your mobile, your mobile platform is, is breakable, it's exploitable. And so, you know, here's some examples on Android, the master key vulnerability. Um, the number that gets touted in the press is about 900 million phones are vulnerable. Um, uh, maybe it's a little bit less, but still a whole bunch. Uh, lots of fragmentation issues, lots of known vulnerabilities on phones, uh, the third-party marketplace risk that comes in and sideloading, and just the other root exploits that are out there. Um, and iOS is, is just as susceptible to different attacks. Uh, bypassing the, the uh, uh, circumventing the passcode, uh, we can uh, bypass the encryption. Uh, the phone will de decrypt most of the data for us if we simply ask it to. Um, because of Apple's closed uh, model approach, there's a monoculture there. Almost everybody uses um, the uh, foundation classes. And so a single issue there um, means that we compromise every phone that's out there. Um, we've done some interesting research that we haven't left, uh, haven't released to the public yet, uh, but there are uh, possibilities to hijack iCloud uh, that we've uncovered. Um, so this is a big issue because apps, uh, iCloud is an always-on service. You've, even if you haven't uh, configured and you're fully using it, it's always on on your iPhone. Um, and data that gets synced up to the iCloud can be compromised by a malicious app. Um, and then uh, accessing data beyond the sandbox. Um, we've come up with some novel ways uh, for an app to reach outside the sandbox uh, and gain access to the system 
for other apps. Um, I'd hope to do a deep dive. I'm going to do it very, very quickly on the master keys uh, Android vulnerability and on the uh, sandbox issue in iOS. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of zip through this. Uh, but, but as many of you saw, just within the last week or two, there's been an enormous amount of conversation around the, what's being called the master key uh, uh, flaw in Android. And the, the problem is, is a, um, uh, a flaw in how the app itself, uh, the app package is being, uh, the digital signature is being verified. And so what happens is when you, when you sign it with your certificate, um, if anybody made a change to the, to the APK file, it would immediately fail certificate uh, check and therefore it would not be installed. Um, what was discovered by uh, actually a number of researchers, somewhat independently, uh, was that um, the APK could actually, you could insert malicious code and still have the signature pass. And the way that worked is that when they verified the uh, APK signature, they started at the top of the file essentially and read down. And they got to the classes.dex, which is where the, the, the code for the app sits, and it passed the check and everything went fine and it went through the rest of the file. Um, but when the file was loaded and installed onto the system, they actually took the last classes.dex and installed that one. So they read the file from the bottom up. And that allowed the attacker to essentially put malicious code into the device. Um, Within a day of doing that, uh, one of our um, uh, security researchers, uh, Paul uh, Olivia, or at Paul on on, uh, on Twitter, um, uh, wrote some proof of concept code. Uh, it since then has been expanded upon by a number of other uh, folks, and now it's simply uh, point and click, uh, and you can exploit a device. We have um, techniques running on every uh, hardware platform within a day of this coming out. Um, so this is a very big challenge that's being faced uh, on the Android platform. Um, the uh, the other, uh, I'm going to briefly touch on the iOS, and then I have to read uh, some questions that are being popped up on my screen here that are that are coming in that I'd like to, to take a moment to answer. But in iOS, um, just like Android, um, uh, apps run inside a sandbox, and they get their own data storage uh, where they can store their documents and their information and their temporary files. Um, and one of the, you know, the big goals if you want to try to compromise um, uh, iOS is how do you break outside the sandbox? Uh, and so we've, we've found uh, several techniques that allow us to get limited access outside the sandbox. Uh, some access to other apps, um, access to system information, what's going on on the platform, things that, that you're not supposed to have access to. And that's um, something that we, you know, we haven't gone public with with any details, but certainly uh, one of the big challenges that it's being faced um, when we find those kinds of vulnerabilities, it affects hundreds of millions of iPhones immediately. Uh, whereas in the in the Android side of things, with the fragmentation, you may have a smaller smaller set of, uh, of phones that are impacted. Uh, but obviously, Android has some very very big numbers in terms of total market share. Um, so these are two examples in, uh, of challenges that are being faced right now uh, by folks. Um, there's a question that came in. Um, if the vulnerability is found, it could be due to malicious intent or from the developers don't keep, uh, don't develop with good security prices. Uh, is there a platform that uh, you believe provides more security benefits to the other? So I think what they're saying is, is that, hey, if app developers are writing bad apps, uh, does iOS or Android perform better? Um, that's a good question. Um, one of the things going for iOS on this is that the apps essentially can't be installed unless you're coming from the App Store. It's very tightly controlled. Um, and so um, if you assume that a poorly uh, coded app did make it through a malicious app and get installed from there, then I think you've got a big challenge on the iOS side. Um, Android, you simply cannot ignore that many, many devices are vulnerable um, and uh, will never be patched by the wireless carriers. And so uh, an app that exploits one of those vulnerabilities can really wreak havoc that's out there. So I guess the way I would answer this is that um, if I was uh, deploying, let's say, uh, an Android phone that was updated regularly, so uh, Google has your own line of Nexus phones. Uh, the latest one, I think, will be from Samsung and one from HTC. Um, and those are updated you know, at a much higher frequency. Um, then my, my feeling would be that the... Uh, velocity of, of security protection, the increased security protections that we're seeing in Android would provide you um, uh, better security. Uh, but if you're stuck on devices uh, directly from carriers, uh, maybe devices that are, are significantly out of date, um, then iOS is going to give you more protection because as soon as they get the, 
the vulnerability patched, they're going to push it out in their next release, uh, and your uh, your folks can update their their devices even probably without involving IT. So it's kind of a mixed bag, and I would say most people do not run Nexus as their main phone, um, so they're probably going to be in a better position on the iOS platform. Um, another question came in about the security uh, assessments, uh, and they said, "How long do mobile app security assessments take, and can they be automated?" Um, the assessments that we do on, on mobile apps, and we shared the stats on a previous slide, um, they used to take us several weeks, and we would usually bring in four separate people because we're trying to test uh, different types. Uh, we spent a lot of time doing automation, uh, and I'm going to uh, flip to the next slide, and it has a, a little picture. We actually have a free open source platform out there called Sentoku Linux, uh, and we take a lot of the tools that, that we use in the security testing, and we automatically bundle them and, and push them out to to Santoku Linux for, for you guys or for your security team. Um, so you can um, do that kind of security testing probably, you know, on an app over the course of a day or a couple of days, you know, if you're using uh, command line tools and things of that sort. Um, if you put your own automation scripts together, we, of course, have a, a commercial platform, via Lab, uh, that automates it for you. Um, we've gotten the, uh, the auditing time for apps down to about 10 to 15 minutes if you want to do a first pass look at are there kind of low or middle hanging fruit vulnerabilities. Um, so there are opportunities to automate uh, security assessments um, and um, to really kind of make it so that you can scale this thing because there's obviously quite a few apps that are out there uh, and so uh, they may represent threats to your business and you have to figure out how do you uh, mitigate that risk. Um, we have some advice, you know, about how do you, uh, how do you address mobile security issues and first of all, it's just you have to be proactive about this. And I, I, we've had uh, about 250 people register for this webinar. I think that's a really good sign that people take this seriously. They're trying to look for ways to solve this problem. And I think, you know, by the fact that you're here today, uh, it shows that, you know, you're trying to look out and understand for your, for your organization what are the threats. Um, so, you know, proactively, uh, first of all, we, we recommend that um, uh, developers and, and uh, security analysts assume that they're operating in a hostile environment. Uh, if you make those assumptions that the device could be compromised, that the network is compromised, um, then you can code apps in ways that, that, mi that minimize the attack surface that you show to the, to the mobile operating system. And that way you really reduce your, your risk. And that, that's not easy to do. It takes education, but it definitely is possible. Um, we recently released a mobile app security audit with CompTIA, um, and they're um, uh, providing iOS and Android certifications for secure uh, mobile development. Um, so getting those folks educated, um, and not only educating the developers and the security teams, but educating the folks that manage risk uh, at a company, the, the, the folks that really can influence policy uh, in, in, in the approach to these issues. Um, and then make sure you're testing your apps, um, whether it's third-party apps or the own apps that you're developing. They need to be tested. You can do it with free tools. You can do it with commercial tools. Um, but you've got to test the apps uh, because the, uh, the vulnerability that exists in those apps put your data at risk. Uh, the second thing um, is, is that, oh, this is just kind of a screenshot in case you were curious about what it looks like. Um, uh, this is taken from Via Lab. Again, you can do these on your own with Sentoku Linux and, and just use command line tools. Um, but doing things like SSL proxy and peeking inside the tunnel, seeing you know, what sort of information is in there and does it put you at risk. Uh, Keychain analysis, dumping the memory. SQL injection is a big challenge, whether it's on the web services or against the apps themselves. Um, so automating these tests, getting them out there, making it simple um, to test that entire mobile attack surface uh, is, is really important. Uh, and I've got one last slide, and then I'm going to uh, turn my attention to the different questions that have been popping up. Um, we think there's a tremendous opportunity, though, to become even more proactive in mobile security. And that's essentially saying, look, these mobile devices contain an enormous amount of information um, that attackers would use against you uh, but you can use them to your benefit. So if you can collect forensic data, if you can collect security data, if you can collect mobile sensor data, you can use that information to determine a baseline for your device, to detect anomalies, uh, to understand when a device gets compromised, what do the behaviors look like? How does it change that device so that you can then use that to protect uh, the device? Um, so automating that collection and anal analysis of that data will allow you to detect attack, detect anomalies in the system, and then prevent future attacks by deploying, let's say, 
uh, updated uh, behavior statistics down to devices and saying, look, if, if your device starts chewing more battery, if it starts talking to known bad IP addresses, if it starts doing, uh, you know, uh, deviating from its own behavior, you might have an issue. And so you potentially push them into a two-factor authentication, uh, push them into the help desk, you can have them bring your phone in if it's serious enough, or, or even wipe the, the corporate data on the phone if it becomes uh, clear that the device has been compromised. Um, but by collecting that data uh, and then using big data analytics, uh, we can really turn this around and say, let's use this information uh, to our advantage. So I'm going to skip up and um, uh, look at some of the questions that have come in. Um, another question was uh, on some of the recent academic research uh, on improving the security of Android and the privacy of Android, such as Taintroid and, and other tools. Uh, we think that this is really uh, pretty important work that needs to be done. Um, universities fund it, but a lot of times they're funding it through the government. Um, DHS has been an incredible partner for us. Uh, they have different types of grants called SIBRs and BAAs. Uh, DARPA has sponsored a number of projects that we're on as well. Um, and so the work that's coming out of academia, oftentimes being funded by the U.S. government, uh, is incredibly important work uh, to improving uh, mobile security for everyone. The government has a very vested interest. Uh, not only do they have a lot of mobile devices and a lot of mobile needs, uh, and so it's important for them to protect their information. Um, they also want to see uh, commerce protected here. They want to see our intellectual property uh, protected. Um, they want to see the innovation uh, behind this industry continue to grow and, and help power our economy. So there's a lot of advantages to that, and some of the funding that comes out of DHS, DARPA, and other uh, programs uh, has been incredibly helpful, and we think really pushing security forward um, uh, for, for not only the United States, but really for the world. Um, so I'm going to look through some of these other questions. While I'm doing that, I do just want to mention that um, our next webinar will be coming up in two weeks. Um, we're going to cover uh, an updated version of the talk that I did at RSA last year, so about mobile encryption. Uh, you know, what, how do you do it right? What, what do you do wrong? And what's just broken? Period. Um, so you can sign up for that online. And we also have a survey that we mentioned at the beginning. Uh, Kevin can paste it back into the comment window. We'd love to hear from you about uh, this webinar or ideas you have for other webinars um, to see whether or not uh, we, we hit the topic that you were looking for and what we could do for, for future webinars. Um, so there's a, a follow-up question. Uh, what are some of the most common vulnerabilities that we see and what do you, what do, you do to prevent them? Um, we have kind of a top five list. And um, on our website, we have a, a free document you can download and, or just simply browse online if you don't want to download the PDF. It's our 42 plus uh, best practices for secure mobile development. And out of the years of, of mobile auditing that we've done, we basically take the most common uh, uh, vulnerabilities that we see, and uh, we provide specific remediation steps on how do you avoid it. Um, the number one problem that we see from developers is that it's simply caching sensitive uh, information on the device. Once you write that information um, to the mobile device, uh, it's going to be incredibly difficult for you to protect it. Um, because we, it's very hard to have a user uh, have an app they're happy to use that's, that's very user friendly, and then you force them to type in an eight-digit alphanumeric PIN on their mobile keyboard. It just doesn't happen, uh, and you will, you know, significantly reduce the number of users. So, uh, without that kind of um, uh, information not stored on the system, without a, a complex passcode, uh, encryption is just not going to work. Uh, and that's why we've never encountered a mobile app that we could not crack the encryption. Uh, because the keys are always located somewhere uh, in there, and we can reverse engineer the code and figure it out. Um, so I would say that's the number one problem that we see. Um, the second one is probably simply related to um, not securing data in transit, so not properly authenticating your SSL certificates, installing weak cert certificates and ciphers on your, on your uh, endpoint. Um, and those are really um, uh, dangerous problems because it allows attackers with, with free software that they can download to just simply mimic a Starbucks or AT&T wireless connection, uh, click a button, and start intercepting uh, traffic and sensitive information. Um, but uh, I would encourage you to take a look at the uh, best practices document, and um, you'll find uh, 30 or 40 pages written up of, uh, in great detail about what, what is being uh, found on these platforms and then how can you uh, mitigate those risks. Um, there's one uh, final question uh, about uh, AV is being limited by the sandbox. So can you provide uh, to people that use MDM or sandboxing um, 
uh, is there any guidance you can provide to folks that are using MDM uh, sandboxing for device security or, or app wrapping? So yeah, I think the question really comes down to is, is if mobile antivirus isn't working, you know, what, what do we do? What can we do? Uh, and a lot of folks end up having MDMs installed. Um, our, uh, we've done audits of quite a few MDM platforms. Um, they end up uh, having their own security risks themselves and sometimes introduce uh, more flaws um, to, uh, to a, a, a device than uh, if it wasn't installed. Not all the time, but we've seen that in the past. Um, and so what we really encourage people to think about is to think about MDM as, a, ma as a, a management platform, but not as a security platform. Security was really kind of uh, bolted on at a later time. Um, and so um, it's important, uh, it, you know, it's in difficult to enforce security if you don't have any visibility in the device, if you can't manage them. So they're very complementary technologies. Um, but uh, if you're looking at your MDM to provide the security on your device, I think you're probably not looking in the right place. Um, now, over time, if you've got um, provisioning profiles and the ability to push apps to devices, um, you can look at installing more proactive security uh, uh, applications onto the device. Um, we don't think that it's antivirus uh, as it stands today, but uh, obviously us and other companies are working hard on technologies that will allow you to uh, collect mobile data and manage the risk uh, there. So I think it's something that is, is changing very rapidly uh, and something to definitely stay, uh, stay tuned in. Um, another question came in uh, just about uh, that there, there's an interest in mobile security assessments uh, rather than forensics. Um, and it was a question about automating uh, mobile security testing. Uh, I, I touched on that briefly. Uh, but I think there's two primary ways to audit mobile security testing. The first one is the freeway, and I want to make sure everybody's aware of that. Again, that's Santoku Linux. Uh, if you download and install that, if your security teams do that, um, they can run different programs. They can automate it with Python or other programming languages, uh, fast scripts or whatever, and really try to, to, to try to push some efficiency there. And of course, we have a, uh, a product via lab that's, that's the entire focus. Um, we're now beginning to push into mobile malware analysis. Uh, malware wasn't sufficiently interesting in the past. It was mostly about premium SMS, maybe some very, very limited banking Trojans. Um, but now uh, building out the tool set so that you can not only do reverse engineering and full proxying, um, updating apps, modifying them, repushing them, uh, fuzzing them, but really uh, adding all of those capabilities in um, to operate on a mobile app, a malicious mobile app, and try to figure out what it's doing uh, where your data has been sent and uh, how you can protect against that. Um, I think that's all the questions that I see right now. Um, so I'm going to take a moment here. I probably need to flip slides. Again, we'd love it if anybody uh, would share their, uh, um, their thoughts with us on the survey. Um, you'll get an email update from us. It'll have a link to the survey if, if you, uh, and you can do it right from your email, I believe. Um, so if you take a minute and have any feedback for us, we're very interested in hearing that. Um, and uh, I will hang on the line for another minute or two. And if no other questions come in, I'd like to, to thank everybody for their time today. And uh, we hope to see you guys uh, again soon in the next webinar or the next conference that we're at. Thanks so much.